Yeah, so it's my turn, I guess. Fair enough. So welcome to a very special episode of Why Did You Read That? in a brand new location. We are in an actual podcasting studio, like professionals. That's right, at the Link Library Innovation Center. Downtown Greeley, available for booking. That's right. You can come and record your own podcast. You can sound as good as this. Yeah. Probably. Maybe better. Maybe. <laughs> Content-wise, almost certainly. Right. That's but, what you know, that's what I was getting at. The qualities of my voice are not replicable, but the uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes. We do we do I kind of did want to try some of these buttons. Yeah, I mean we are doing like the October episode, so Say say which episode we're doing again. We're doing the Halloween episode. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I don't know, Christmas episode? Yeah. We can come back. Holiday, excuse me. Right. It's very elfin. Holiday, holiday oh, times no. are... Stop, stop that. <laughs> and then this is like our... Uh... We're lost in a cave. I'm down in the well. Timmy's in the well. What was the... Uh, oh... In our old office, do you remember we had that book the, cart that would echo? And when it was empty, it, yeah, it would echo. Yeah, and it would sound like this. It was like, I'm down in the well. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> and we've got, I like this one quite a bit. You would. <laughs> when I talk about my scary book today, I'll be like... One of the books I brought today was... Evil Bigfoot Monster. Very nice. <laughs> I like it. And of course, uh, you know, this is a needed addition for you, mostly. Oh, how, how dare. <laughs> <laughs> if you can stop. I, okay. So anyway. Yeah. So um, we are we are doing our, our what? Why did you read that podcast? Where I bring four books and Peter brings four books and we talk about two of them in depth. And then we talk about the other two kind of also in depth because we can't help ourselves. That's right. And when you were just like, when you did the the what or whatever, when you stumbled over the question word, I just thought I was like, you know, sometimes the books I bring on a month, I should call it, how did you read that? <laughs> because that's really the you question. You do sometimes I'm, punish yourself. There, there's a couple in here that uh, beg the question. Yeah. Actually, three of them sound like they beg the question, but one of them secretly doesn't. Oh. Anyway. I'm intrigued. But before we get started, we always have to have the joke. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. So, what's, uh, after a bad harvest, mm -hmm. why did the farmer decide to try a career in music? I don't know. Because he had a lot of sick beats. <laughs> okay, like that. One. Yep. <laughs> I wish one of these buttons was like an applause. That's what yeah, we really need. That's, yeah, we need to get a little effects. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Do you All want right. to tell me about your books and sure. then and then we'll go from there? Yeah, let's do it. So my first book uh, is Arrangements in Blue by Amy Key. And this is a series of personal essays that's kind of organized around her relationship to the album Blue by Joni Mitchell. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that. Naturally. So she wrote several essays around basically romantic love and its role or lack thereof in her life and how she's always been searching for it and the way that these songs kind of created that and informed that throughout her life. Okay. So there's that one. Beautiful. Then I did a graphic novel called Eat the Rich by Sarah Gailey. Okay. Which is, I mean, you've got the title. That kind of. Eat the Rich. That's a, an Aerosmith song. It is an Aerosmith song. It's also a saying. I feel like this is like. This one. Eat the Rich. <laughs> That's now how you, some you of that like 80s chipmunk. metal sounds. <laughs> 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 the chipmunks really should have covered more 80s metal. I feel like that's a natural fit. Also, early 2000s emo pop punk. Your panics at the disco, your falls yeah. out boys. I'm, I'm a little, little old for more than passing familiarity. I gotta say. Fair enough. Okay, Eat the Rich by Sarah somebody. Sarah Gailey. Gailey. Okay. Who also wrote the books about, you know, if, what if they brought hippopotamuses to live in the Mississippi River? Which... It's called River of Teeth. 
Is that like a an actual like a? It was a plan. It never happened, but there it, somebody did bring it up. Okay. So why? I don't remember. Okay. But you know, you it's fair it up, to not remember because it's it can't be a good reason. I mean, it was probably for like <laughs> livestock. Sure. But I mean, that's some deadly livestock. So it seems like a lot to handle. You know, yeah. the hippo is like fun at the zoo. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, Cute in real they're life, tiny. they're horrifying. But yeah. Then yeah. they grow really big and you're like, that could kill me. Yeah. They're like the bears of the, uh, I don't know, desert? Savannah? Mm, the river? I mean, they the live, rivers? They were, yeah, the river. They're I the bears the of wherever they are and bears are not. Correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, my third title is The Viking Heart by Arthur Herman, which is basically a history of the Scandinavian people. Okay. Uh, and also a little bit of a takedown of the white supremacist appropriation of Viking culture. So, mm, okay. Which I appreciate as someone who is Scandinavian by descent. <laughs> I've been fooled by a couple things like that yeah. uh, in my, in my searchings online for things to read and stuff. And yeah. I'll see something that's like, Oh, this is like a, you know, a way of life that you can, you know, adopt and whatever. And I'm like, oh, this sounds kind of interesting. And then I go to the author's website and it's like, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no. The Aryan peoples. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I thought you were introducing something new. But yeah, yeah. this this is not that new and really not not super into it. Yeah. Well, and also happily, it turns out to largely not be true. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was a whole Nazi thing. They were like, hey, look at all these blonde haired Vikings. Let's let's idolize them. OK, um, sure. But yeah, not not into it. So seems <laughs> seems kind of silly. But yeah, you know, that seems like their thing. So. so that's my my history. And then I have a romance called Every Wish Way by <laughs> Shannon Bright which is about uh, this woman who has her life completely together, except romantically. She has a very disapproving mother who thinks that all men are trash and romantic love is a waste of time. And she winds up summoning like this, like a genie, not a genie, but like a genie who can grant three wishes. And so she ends up using one to create uh, the modern Mr. Darcy. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And of course, you know, that never that never works out like you think it will. No. That's like a, a very sitcom staple of yeah. step, not mother-in-law slash mother who either either is a um, Luxana Troy from Star Trek TNG who's like, why don't you get married? Get married. <laughs> Every time I'm on this show, I'm basically trying to get you married. Yep. And then there's the opposite, which is like, uh, who is it from Bewitched? The mom. Oh, Yeah. I want to say it's like Desdemona or Esmeralda or something like that. Yeah, but who's basically like, well, you're married and I don't like him. I'm going to yeah. basically do a TV friendly version of casting him into the pits of hell for, yeah. if I can. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'm curious about all of these, mm. but why don't we start with, why don't we start with Viking Heart? Okay. I'm interested. I'm curious. All right. Um, so like I said, I listened to this one because um, a half of my family is descended. Actually, it turns out more than half, but um, I have some Norwegian blood in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also have uh, English and German blood and uh, Irish. It turns out that that is all kind of Viking because uh, Vikings descended into Germany and became the Goths. And um, so... Germans are basically Vikings, too. So <laughs> turns out a lot of me is uh, descended from the Northlands. And uh, so it, it's basically just a long history of all of the cool things that Scandinavians have done and also like undermining a lot of these arguments that, you know, it's because they're like some superior white race. Because mm. in actuality, um, Scandinavians have never been united by like race. It's always been common culture and mm -hmm. uh, language. So uh, one thing I learned is that actually Norwegian as a language is relatively recent. Hmm. <laughs> Before then, they spoke mainly Swedish. Uh, and even now, um, like I was trying to find uh, 
trying to find some lessons to learn Norwegian, and it's called Bokmal, which is like a, a dialect and not even called Norwegian. It's like the common, <laughs> common version of Norwegian that huh. everyday people speak. But anyway, lots of cool and interesting stories. Um, it tied into my um, polar exploration thing because mm-hmm. uh, all of a sudden I'm, I listen to this on audiobook and I hear the narrator say the name Fridjof Nansen. And mm-hmm. I was like, I know that name. Why do I know that name? And I was like, this is the North Pole guy. And so I was, you know, all prepared for him to talk about his North Pole adventures. And he did a little bit, but mainly he's known like he won the Nobel Peace Prize Mm -hmm. because during World War II, he started the Nansen Passport, which got um, people who were displaced by war. It gave them a way to get to safe places. And Mm. he saved something like 50,000 lives. That's pretty good. um, He was a diplomat and he created this passport and got governments on board and um, a lot of Russians were displaced by the war and he was able to like get them safely across borders and I'm picturing this like uh, his figures from history baseball card Uh, and his stats for life saved it's actually I say baseball card I mean Marvel Comics trading card because that's (laughs) that's what I trafficked in Sure, sure and you know it would have like strength agility intelligence and so these history, yeah, would be like live saved and his bar would be all the way up. Yeah. <laughs> he was, it turns out he was a super cool guy and I already was interested in him because he not only, you know, at one point was the person who had been the furthest north um, ever, but he was super chill about it. Like I had also been reading about the, um, the American who was also searching for the North Pole, who was very like, I've been furthest north. It was me. I've been there. And Nansen was like, good job. You know, and not at all competitive. He's and just I, like, like rad, super dude. chill about it. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there's possibly a family connection for me because uh, I learned about this guy in uh, from Wisconsin, which is where my Ameri- like where my Norwegian relatives settled when they emigrated to the U.S. was Wisconsin, and my grandmother's maiden name was Heg H E G G, which I always thought was an Ellis Island name. It turns out it's not. Uh, and there was this guy named Heg from Wisconsin who started a Norwegian regiment for the Civil War to fight against the South and against slavery because it turns out that Scandinavians, despite their long history of pillaging and slavery, um, eventually they became very humanist and very anti-slavery and very pro-education and like super hmm. cool. And so when the Civil War started, he started a Norwegian regiment. They gave orders in Norwegian, like it was all Norwegians, and they fought in the Civil War. I like that. I always, it's funny, I don't know, when you look back at history sometimes and people are like, oh, well, you know, these people did this and so on. And I'm like, yeah, but they changed their minds. Yeah. Like also a very if long we time ago. Far enough, like, <laughs> we were all doing terrible things. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> but you know, eventually somebody was like, dude, yeah. <laughs> this is not. Cool. Like yeah. we got to We got to do this different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, lots of little stories like that and um, the way that Scandinavia was unique in how it moved out of paganism and into mm. Christianity and how a lot of its pagan past was preserved because it was done so intentionally. Mm-hmm. Like they were like, we're going to honor our past but start a new future, but preserve, you know, so a lot of the, those old wooden churches, which have been, would have been so easy to destroy, you know, they kept and, you know, a Hmm. lot of the, yeah, it's just, I think it's cool. Did it mention at all Scandinavian metal? Um, I briefly, cause that, um, that one guy who shot everyone for the white supremacist Norwegian who shot a bunch of people on an Island. Mm -hmm. I think he was into that, that metal scene. Okay. But not, not really. Fair enough. You know, that's always that's one of my pet peeves is they're always like it's we've never learned the lesson of like somebody does that and like does a mass shooting and they're like, maybe it's the music he was listening to. And you're like, come on, guys. I mean, metal is really popular in Scandinavia overall is my understanding. I just went to a metal concert a few weeks ago. It was full of the nicest people I've ever met. And I, I don't mean that as like a. Metal people are fine, you know, whatever. I mean, like, I was genuinely surprised how nice everybody was. (laughs) Because they were not just nice, they were very nice. Right. And polite. It was weird. It wasn't what I expected. And I did not expect, you know, somebody to 
punch me in the face because they were right. so pumped about a song. <laughs> but well, I think that often ends up being true because, like, they always said, like, oh, people with tattoos are scary. But some of the nicest people I've ever known have been, like, you know, full sleeves and neck tattoos. And they're just, you know, I think the, the guy uh, that I'm thinking of that I met in college was a poet. Yeah. He was a poet and an English professor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So there's so much in there. I couldn't go into all of it, but it goes into like the the heavy water sabotage, you know, when the Nazis occupied Norway and how, you know, there was this intense Norwegian, you know, spy mission to to disable the heavy water plant so that the Nazis wouldn't get the, the atomic bomb. Mm. And, you know, just, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. All of these cool little stories, things that I'd heard of and things that I'd never heard of. And um, I don't know. It's just I know that if you look into like any any heritage of any people, it's going to be filled with like these cool little stories of why those people are cool. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just nice to read them when it's about, you know, the people you're descended from and be like, I come from cool people and makes you want to kind of be better, too. True. True. Nice. So, yeah. All right. All right. Hit me with your four. Okay. First, I've got a book called Playground by Aaron Beauregard. Okay. Um, This has been kind of burning up like book talk and stuff, and Ah. it's a piece of extreme horror. Extreme horror. Extreme horror. It's pretty extreme. Okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah. All right. Uh, Next, I've got a book called Evil Bigfoot Monster by F.F. Monsoon. Would you like to redo that with your scary voice? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Is that nope? That's Chipmunk. Evil Bigfoot Monster by FF Monsoon. Spooky. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and FF Monsoon is actually a pen name for Jeff Strand. Uh, <laughs> that explains why you read it. Yep. Um, there's kind of a story behind you know why he did it under a fake name, but basically it's like um. I would call it the Sharknado of books. Okay. Where they kind of, he came up with a terrible premise and said, said something that's kind of terrible on purpose, um, but it it works. Terrible, but fun. Yes. Gotcha. And also very short. Okay. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It'd be, you know, if a Sharknado movie, I looked them up because I was like, they must, and they're all like right in the 90 minute range. Because I was like, okay, somebody over there knows what they're doing. No Lord of the Rings sagas. No. Yeah. Because if you made one of this, you know, two hours and 40 minutes, yeah. it'd be like, guys, Or like no. the extended editions, like yeah, a good solid no. almost four hours. Nope. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> Don't need that. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, next is a children's book Ooh. called There's a Ghost in This Book by Oliver Jeffers. It has kind of a cute physical gimmick okay. involved with it. And then the last is... Now, you talked about your people. Some. Yes. Uh, I come from, well, mostly Polish. I had just found out what my great-grandfather's name was, by the way, and it's like the most Polish thing I've ever seen in my life. Hit me. There's so many W's. I'll have to, I have to look at it. Okay. Because I can't remember exactly I what it was. I have an aunt by marriage who's Polish, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. I just sent it to all of my family because I was like, look at this. Okay. Uh, Władysław George Dzerzinski. <laughs> Dzerzinski. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is like if you made up a fake for Polish name. I You're mean, just it's like, I Polish. don't know, Władysław. That sounds pretty good. And then George. Okay, Dzerzinski. <laughs> There's an extra D in there that really doesn't need to be in there. And then, uh, yeah, some some relative of mine wisely shortened it quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but my other side of my you know heritage is mostly irish okay so this is the making of the movie leprechaun i need me gold by b harrison smith (laughs) here i'm taking you seriously (laughs) i should know better yeah what a mistake (laughs) this is like i don't know our 30th episode or something Uh, silly me like oh this is gonna be (laughs) oh no this is about the making of the movie leprechaun all right um you know, starring Warwick Davis mm-hmm. and Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, famously. And Jennifer Aniston's original nose. Oh, scandal. Yep. yep. She says she got it fixed for uh, deviated septum. Yeah. Which is possible. Yeah. I really don't know. 
It doesn't look that different to me, but I mean, I'm it's a not terrible... a Jennifer Grey situation where she looks like a whole new person. I don't know that. what she looks like. I don't know who that is. Jennifer Grey from yeah. Dirty Dancing. Oh, okay. I yeah. don't know what she looks like. Well, she got a nose job after Dirty Dancing, and she looks different. She looks like a different person. It's it's weird. She says it kind of ruined her career. Her nose job. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, is she the sister in Ferris Bueller? Yes. Okay. She did have a recognizable nose. Yeah. But yeah, why would you? I don't know. It's not for me because I'm like Jennifer Aniston. I'm like, well, maybe she did get a nose job. And then I'm like, well, she's kind of often recognized as one of the more beautiful people in the world. So I'm like, so I guess she knew what she was doing. Yeah. Worked out. Hollywood's hard, though. Yeah. It's always like you could be more beautiful if you fixed fixed these three things. That's true. I guess it's a different standard, right? Because for me, it's like, they're like, you could have a, a whole surgery and we could break your nose and you'd be like 2% better looking. And I'm like, nah, no thanks. Doesn't sound worth it. I'll pass. Yeah. But, you know, if I had to see my face gigantic on a screen sometimes, well, maybe, maybe, maybe. And it's like, this could be the difference between you being a leading man and being a, you know, character actor. That's the thing, though. I would prefer to be a character actor, yeah. I think. Probably not the salary. Well, that's the but thing. I think I'd prefer. It seems like you'd have more fun. I mean, yeah. I feel like Steve Buscemi has a lot more fun in movies than, you know, Chris Evans. He's been in some good stuff, too. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. Leprechaun. You want to hear about Leprechaun? No, I'm, oh. I just wanted to know if you had more to say about <laughs> Um, You know, I feel like the title mostly speaks for itself. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I have to admit that I'm I'm intrigued by several of these. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of want to start with Playground because extreme horror is. I want to know what, what makes it so extreme. Well, I'm a little afraid. Okay then. Um, so this is a book that's been I I came across it online because you know the algorithms of things know me. Right. So I get a lot of the posts of people being like these are the five books that you know uh made it so I couldn't sleep for a month or whatever. And you're you like know? sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like okay. <laughs> and then usually I'm looking and they're like this book this book and I'm like oh, okay. You know, amateur. Right. Whatever. But this one popped up a few times and a few different Aaron Beauregard books popped up so I was like all right, I'll give this a shot. Um, is this Aaron with an E or a double A? I think it's with a single A. Okay. I think he spells his name like A-R-O-N and then Beauregard, but with two A's in okay. guard. Okay. It's a weird spelling. Okay. Um, I was just curious if this was a, a female or... Oh, I actually or... don't know for sure. Okay. I think it's a dude, but that could just be because everyone thinks it's a dude. Sure. So I, I'm not sure. Everyone thinks Riley Sager's in a woman, so. Oh, I thought that. Yeah, no. Riley Sager's not a woman? Nope. Huh. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, if Aaron Beauregard is not a dude, they are not making any effort to... Uh, Correct. The, yeah. Yeah. They're like, eh, whatever. Yeah. So, basically, um, I guess the quick way I would summarize this is if you imagine a Saw movie, Ugh. but instead of a bunch of adults in, like, a gross warehouse, it's a bunch of kids... Uh, locked in a big facility with a bunch of playground equipment. So it's like this um, this old lady who, for kind of uh, not great outlined reasons, wants to kill a bunch of kids in a weird way. She recruits a literal Nazi scientist um, who builds these weird contraptions. And then she also has working for her a sort of lurch type figure. Okay. Um, and they bring in a bunch of kids and their parents and they think they're just like testing out new playground equipment and they're going to get paid like, you know, $20,000 or something. So these parents are all like, all right, yeah, sure. <laughs> and the parents range from, uh, you know, there's a few of them who are good people and there are some of them who are like the worst there's a family with a dad who's the absolute worst of like, you know, my son's going to be a professional baseball player so that I can, you know, coast on that forever. And our daughter is not going to do sports because that's for boys, you know, and that, you know. Yeah. He's a real jerk. Yeah. Sounds like a prince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then uh, they go to this place. It's like a big mansion and they have a playground. But then at some point 
uh, they release the hounds and the dogs chase all the kids into this uh, locked shed type of thing that's on the playground, which is an elevator that takes them to the real playground Mm. in which they find many deadly pieces of playground equipment that they have to navigate in order to uh, escape, basically. Interesting choice to use children. Yeah. (laughs) Well... That was part of, I think, I think that's part of what makes it extreme Yeah, is because it's kids and they range in age from probably, the youngest is probably like eight or nine. The oldest is maybe like 14. Um, I had read somewhere that Nightmare on Elm Street was actually supposed to, originally Mm. was supposed to be about Freddy coming to kids in their dreams. Um, Because, you know, the parents of the Elm Street kids killed Freddy. Right. And then it was supposed to be he came back to kill those kids. But they changed it to be um, all the kids that Freddy killed when he was alive had younger siblings who didn't know they had older siblings. Uh And so and then Freddy didn't come for them until they were like high school age. Reason being somebody at the studio wisely was like, you know, I think it might be a little distasteful to people. To watch this, like, adult man killing children. I don't think the movie would have had the legs that it's had. I think, yeah, I think it's like a, by then it was a semi-established formula of, like, slasher killing teens. And we're like, we can accept teenagers, usually played by people in their mid-20s, being killed by Freddy is, you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. But, yeah, like an eight-year-old, you're like, oh, this is a little weird. Yeah. So I think that's a big part of what makes this extreme. There's a lot of gore in it, okay. um, and there's, you know, no shortage of uh, vivid descriptions of, um, yeah, kids getting, you know, bludgeoned and melted by acid and cut up by things and just all kinds of stuff. All right. Um, I was just kind of half imagining a, a, a playground from my youth when it was mm-hmm. like, Here's a really tall metal slide that mm-hmm. can either burn the skin off your legs or slice you. Here's like that merry-go-round thing that everyone's going to like run really fast and then you're just going to go shooting across the playground. That's basically what it's kind of like. <laughs> they go down a slide that has uh, razor blades embedded in it so mm-hmm. they get cut up and there's, I think there's a merry-go-round type of thing and they all have to hang on while it's like going fast because if they fly off, they go into a pit or something. I mean, with that, take away the pit and that's my youth. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's kind of funny because when you think about it, you're like this book, it's like a playground designed by a Nazi scientist for the purpose of killing children. Mm-hmm. And you're like, it's not that different. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we were playing on gravel instead yeah. of like these nice rubberized like floors that kids have these days. I got to believe playgrounds designed in, let's say, the 60s, 70s and probably even the 80s. It's like, did they have like real, you know, what kind of degree did you need to design a playground or was it just like, eh? I mean, we were indestructible, though. Like those of yeah, us that made that's it true. out. It did weed out the week. It did. (laughs) Yeah, you're not going to make it. Um, There's also pretty early in the book, and it's not really repeated, but early in the book, there's a pretty graphic sexual scene Mm -hmm. that I would describe as a gross out sexual scene, which is kind of infamous for. Yes. Yes. This is before the kids are on the scene. um, And it's pretty unrelated and not. Certainly not necessary, but I mean, we're talking about a book where nothing is necessary. True. So, and that's kind of infamous too for a lot of people reading it. They don't, that's that's a jump off point for a lot of people. I think if you had the Kindle stats for it, mm. it'd be like, you know, page, I don't know, 40 or something is where a lot of people jump off. <laughs> um, They're like, thank you, I say no. So, I... Overall, I enjoyed it. I mean, it was a different flavor for the palate right? because it was extreme and it kind of dabbles in, you know, being extreme for the sake of being extreme. At the same time, I feel like that's something we say about things that are extreme, but we don't really say that about like comedies. We're not like, oh, that's just jokes for the sake of jokes. You know what I mean? It's like, "Eh, okay, well, yeah, it's supposed to be funny and 
Um, we don't really say that for action movies where it's like the sequence. Was, it's like this sequence in Demolition Man was only there because they wanted to have an action sequence. Hey, people do say that stuff, you know. They do. Like when Bridesmaids came out and everyone was like, they just have these gross out scenes just for laughs. And it's like, well. You know. Yeah. But I think they're wrong when people yeah. say that. I'm like, well, yeah, it's fu- it's funny. Yeah. It's supposed to be. It's more like to me, if you have something for the sake of laughs and it's not funny, then it doesn't work. Right. But if you have something for the sake of laughs and it gets a laugh, all right, that's fine, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so this was like extreme for the sake of being extreme, but I found it mildly, certainly kind of, ex- I'm dead inside. <laughs> so I'm like, that's something everyone needs to know. Like, it's pretty hard for me. I don't think I've ever read a book that I've been like, I cannot go on because it's too vividly graphic and gross or yeah. something. That's never happened. i I welcome it. I'm trying. I'm sure I'll find it. But um, <laughs> if if you're even a little bit, you know, if you're squeamish, right. I would not select this one. If you're, um, and I think it has pretty thorough warnings at the beginning, but it's kind of a blanket warning. It's not like specific trigger warnings. It's right. like, listen, this is meant to be an extreme book. And if that's not what you want. Don't read this book. And it's pretty plain spoken that way. Yeah. So uh, know what you're getting into. But if that's for you, if that kind of thing is for you, it's pretty good. There's a little bit of the writing is rough, in my opinion, because I think what was happening is the writer was trying to make it a more legit by using some turns of phrase and stuff that were a little flowery. But I think... Uh, it doesn't quite pull it off. So right, more writerly, you mean, like a little bit? Like yeah. it seemed like that's what they were going for, okay. but it, you could. It felt really unnatural for the writer. Like right. I felt like I think this is the first time this writer used this phrase, or I don't think this writer talks this way, and that's not appealing to me. But I pushed through because I had I had to see it through. Sure, I had to know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Do uh, any of the children survive? Um, I don't want to say because that would spoil it, but I guess I could I could tell you and then, um, you know, if anyone is going to read it, just skip the next like 30 seconds okay. of this podcast starting, starting now. Um, yes. Okay. One of the kids survives. There's a kid who's been like traumatized through his life. And so then he shows up and he's actually kind of able to handle it a little better than the other kids because he's he's yeah. a kid with that thousand yard stare. He's the indestructible one. <laughs> Basically. All right. Uh, so that's uh, Playground by okay. Aaron Beauregard. You always find the interesting ones. I'll give you that. You know, I, I like to I like to bring it for the... I always like when I'm reading something like that, one of the advantages of doing this podcast is I'm like, if nothing else, it's something for me to talk about on yeah. the podcast. True. All right. All right. Do you need a reminder? I have Arrangements in Blue mm-hmm. by Amy Key. Key. Which is about Joni Mitchell's Blue Album. Essays kind of around that. Yeah. Eat the Rich, mm-hmm. uh, Viking Heart, and Every Wish Way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the most fun one to say. <laughs> but I think I want to hear about Arrangements in Blue. Really? I don't think we talk about essays that often. Yeah, that's true. And I, I do like that. So Okay. I kind of thought you'd pick Eat the Rich, so I'm... I was thinking about it. I am off my footing, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I picked this because um, Joni Mitchell's Blue is, for me, like nearly a perfect album. It's mm. one of those albums that I can listen to over and over, and I always love it. And so when I saw that there was this book of essays kind of centered around blue. I was like, well, I'll I'll read that. Uh, So Amy Key is from the UK um, and she is a poet primarily. That's how she kind of got her start. And this is her first crack at at essays. And she actually, um, she got some kind of a, a grant for to develop this project right before COVID. So she was on a plane traveling to L.A. Initially, she was going to um, write about something more, you know, specific to Joni Mitchell and less personal. Um, Mm. And she was going to go to L.A. and see like some of the places like see the canyon home that Joni Mitchell used to live in and all of that stuff. 
And so she was kind of like on a plane right as the COVID stuff was starting to like mm. come online. Um, so her COVID what trip. What a great place to be when you're yeah. <laughs> in another, on your way to another country. Yep. <laughs> So I think she landed and she did some of her initial stuff and then she ended up changing plans and um, sharing uh, like a rental vacation home with somebody she knew from home who happened to be in California. And um, so she she writes about that. She writes about um, her childhood a lot. And it's all kind of centered around um, how her entire life she's had this intense desire to experience romantic love. And to, you know, have a partner and build a family and have children and how her life has not actually developed in a way where that's happened Mm. and kind of why. And um, I don't know. It's interesting. And each each song on the album kind of touches on that. And she talks a little bit about how maybe some of the songs on Blue developed in her some expectation of what would happen or how it would happen. And maybe it was unrealistic. And Mm. um, she writes about how the closest she ever came to maybe having someone, you know, experience romantic love for her was a friend of hers who was a poet. Um, I think he was maybe Irish and he passed away. He was a major alcoholic Mm. um, and ended up dying. Uh, due to complications from that. Alcoholic poet, you say. I know. Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> that never That's happens. Certainly outside my experience from the English English major. Yeah. So she writes about her relationship with him and how she deeply loved him as a friend, but didn't, you know, love him as a romantic partner, mm-hmm. but sometimes would wonder, like, what if we had gotten married? You know, mm-hmm. me, could I have saved him? Would I have mm-hmm. developed love for him? Mm. You know, so it's it's intensely personal and um, she exposes kind of the good, bad and the ugly of her life. She's not always likable because you can, you know, when you're being really honest with yourself mm-hmm. and you can see, you know, your motivations or the the way that you are performing and reperforming patterns like you're doing the same thing over and over again. And it's not getting you what you want, Mm -hmm. but you keep doing it anyway. (laughs) And, you know, when you're outside of that, you can really see it. And so you see that in her and you get frustrated, but also she sees it in herself as well. And Mm. then so you almost immediately get over that and feel sympathy for her again Um, because she's throughout all of these essays. She's being very brutally honest with herself and her life and her choices. Um, So it's sometimes uncomfortable Um, to read, but I thought that they were really well done. I thought that she was super brave and made herself really vulnerable uh, in the topic of her writing and in exposing her life like that Mm -hmm. and her disappointment. I think it's really hard sometimes to expose your disappointments. And um, so, yeah. And also she, she, um, she does a little bit of singing from Joni Mitchell talks about how Wanting to play blue is one of the reasons that she took up piano. And Mm. um, so, yeah, it's just if you like Joni Mitchell or if you are interested in really intensely personal essays, um, I would read it. Uh, But be prepared to not feel super comfortable because it's not always super comfortable subjects. I like that. I like books like that because I think that works in a book in a way that doesn't always work in other media. Like, yeah. Well, and I listened to this in audio and mm. she narrated it herself and that might have contributed to my feelings of awkwardness. Yeah. Um, but also like it heightened the personal nature of the essays. Like she's telling you about her life and not pulling any punches. And um, like I said, I think it was very brave of her to do. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I would have been capable of being that open. I think it's nice because it like when the person is being very real that way. Yeah. You know, like it's like when you read a travel memoir or something and they never mention like anything that went wrong or like uh, I went to this horrible bathroom, you know, wherever. And you're like, (laughs) all right, 
and they never mention it, and you're like, come on. Yeah, my, I really? got pocketed at this one place, and it was terrible. Or yeah. yeah, and it's like you're reading it, and you're like, I don't know. This just feels like a 60-second Instagram reel of, like, all the great things I saw in Japan, you know? Right. And you're like, but, you know, right. is that really? So I like when people present their life story with a little bit more yeah. uh, ups and down. Yeah. Well, she has a lot of downs. It's, you know, sad. It sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. But she also, I don't know the, the way she, so I, part of what made me interested in this is I also have like never really gotten married, never really had a long-term romantic partner or anything like that. I'm super comfortable with that. Um, So listening to her be so dissatisfied with that was an interesting experience for me because Mm. I've been pretty comfortable with the way my life has turned out and you know, the freedom that it's kind of left me with Mm -hmm. Um, and watching her kind of work through her different feelings, but end up in a little bit of a similar place. Um, She, she ends up finding like peace in the way that her life is and also keeping, you know, the options open for like life's not over, like just because you don't, you know, yeah. Follow the truth. You know, you date someone in college, you get married <laughs> in your 30s, you have kids by 35. Like, yeah, <laughs> you know. that whole thing. Yeah. I, I think we just fi- we just hit on accidentally how you become a millionaire. You got to write <laughs> your book about like being happy, you know, and not doing that. Cr- just. I'm like struggling to come up with the word because I hate it so much of that like <laughs> life plan that you're like, yeah. this started when I was 19 and, you know, I had it all planned out. And then yeah. I kind of uh, go into a deep depression because it didn't work out the way that I just sort of invented right. that it would go when I was like 19 years old. Yeah. And, you know, like that whole thing is just, I think, the worst. <laughs> it is the worst. And it's a thing we do about all kinds of stuff. Like, I know. When uh, when I lost my mom, I had all of these ideas in my head about the way grief would work. Yeah. You know, like, oh, you're going to be really, really sad. And then in about three months, you'll start to feel better. And in a year, you'll be you'll process everything. You'll be back to normal. Oh, Megan. I know. <laughs> a year. I was like, this, this is all made up. Yeah. I don't know where. Like, I think it's from like movies and TV and books. Like you just that's the way that we all think of things. And then it's like you experience it and you're like, oh, that's not reality. Yeah, no. It's like cut to two years later and you're like, you know what? Today I think I'm sadder about this than I've ever been. Yeah. You know? (laughs) Like it got to the point where I was like, you know what? Might be time to talk to a doctor. (laughs) For real. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. I feel like if, yeah, that's what you need to do is write that book. Yeah. It's like, here's the guide. Because, you know, that, that whole thing is just so silly. And I feel yeah. like, I feel like, you know, to be a little bit uh, categorized for a moment, I think young ladies are fall more victim to that yeah. than the young fellas or more commonly, I think. You know, I used to think that was true. But anymore, when you hear about like this quote unquote incel thing on the Internet. Oh, yeah. I think that I think it's sold to, to everyone. Maybe. This like you have to have a partner. I just had, um, so my sister got married and then my younger brother is engaged and they both, they both have, uh, uh, heterosexual relationships. And in both cases, it's the man in the relationship who has been like pushing for like the dream wedding. Yeah. They're like, this is how I pictured my wedding. And I was like, huh, yeah. that's, that's a little Times unusual. They are a changing. I guess so. Yeah. And which, because I'm also like, listen, I'm kind of with your spouses. Like, <laughs> this seems like a lot of money. Yeah, buy a house. Take an epic vacation, you know. I'm like, you know, for the amount that you're paying for your venue, yeah. I went to like a whole grad school for that. Yeah. Well, and <laughs> I have on, friends who, who have spent money on the big weddings and I have heard regrets. Yeah. You know, they're always like, if I had it to do again, I wouldn't. Oh, man. I went to a wedding once with uh, I didn't know the people super well. It was like, you know, partners, friends wedding. Right. But we were there and the bride It was like the reception was happening and she had changed out of her wedding dress and, you know, was in sneakers and stuff sitting on a bench. And she was looking around and people are dancing and having a good time. And she was like, this was such a waste of money. And I was like, yeah, you haven't even left the venue yet. (laughs) I always feel bad for the like the 
the wedding couple. Yeah. Because they it's like they never get to enjoy no. the stuff that they planned. Yeah. It's like the I somebody was telling me a story about, you know, hearing a groom at the reception say like, I I want some of these hors d'oeuvres. And it's like, oh, we're out of those, but we can give you some of these. That was the one thing I wanted was those hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> and I was just like, that's heartbreaking. You spend all this money and like the one thing you're looking forward to mm-hmm. at the at the dinner is the thing that you don't get. Yeah. Yep. And it's always like, you know, the bride and the groom are like, we didn't talk to anybody Mm -hmm. or, you know, the people getting married, like, don't talk to their family. (laughs) They don't talk to anybody. They're just like, ah, we just ran around for four hours. I don't know. Down with the big weddings. I'm not into it. I mean, I guess if it's your thing, like you do you, but I don't get it. Even as an attendee, I'm like, "Eh, I could take it or leave it. Yeah. Like, I don't need it. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Consider it. You could you could save a bunch of uh, Amy Keys some heartache maybe yeah yeah although she ended up with this really like excellent book of essays that's so. true so yeah if you'd Nothing written your wasted. book it would have destroyed art how would you yeah. feel about that Megan <laughs> hey you're the one who came up with this idea don't pin this on me <laughs> all right well that all sounds right. really good yeah I I would recommend it um I thought it was great. So I would like to hear about your children's book. Okay. I think. There's a ghost in this book by Oliver Jeffers. This is my favorite children's author. Um, when I did story times, he has a book called Stuck, mm-hmm. which I read often. Um, it's about a kid. Is this one of the tree? Yeah. Okay. He gets one of his, a kite stuck in a tree and he like throws one of his shoes to get it down and then he throws the other shoe and then he does all these different, and it's got this great classic comedy moment because eventually he gets a ladder. And so he like brings the ladder out and he's like figuring out how to arrange it and stuff like that. And then he hurls the ladder into the tree to also <laughs> knock the guy down. And I was like, this is perfect. This is like baby's first, you know, set up punchline right. joke that's not telegraphed as a joke. Like you don't know it's a joke until it happens. And then you're like, OK. So anyway, he's done a bunch of children's books that are super good. Um this one is basically narrated by a sort of Wednesday Adams looking little kid who's walking around in this creepy looking haunted house. And the haunted house is like pictures of a house, it appears. Okay. Um, like real pictures. Oh, okay. And then, so photographs. Yeah. Okay. And what's cool about it. So, you know, uh, Wednesday Adams is walking around saying like, there's rumors that there's a ghost in this house, you know, and the next page is like, but I've never seen one. Maybe you can help me find one. But every... Other page is basically a piece of wax paper okay. that has a ghost painted on it. So what happens is you have page one and it's like, I've heard there's a ghost in this house. Then page two is this wax paper sheet. So when you flip it over, it overlays on the first page and you can see all the artwork from the first page, but it also adds a ghost into the first page. Oh, that's fun. And so the ghosts are like in the background, like they're sitting on chairs or they're like height peeking out from behind a wall and stuff like that. It's a very, like, um, it's a very, well, in my house, we call this Cassie Halloween. That's my partner's <laughs> name. She likes cutesy Halloween. Right. You know, she likes uh, a little black cat in a witch's hat, you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, I want, like, you know, blood shooting off the walls. Yeah. <laughs> like of- it's funny. We're both sitting here in Halloween t-shirts. Yeah. So. <laughs> We had a Halloween party once and it was like really funny because we didn't really discuss it before and we started decorating. (laughs) It became very apparent who had done what. Like I did the bathroom and it was like there was blood everywhere and, you know, (laughs) like uh, I put like blood gel on the mirror and all kinds of stuff. And then hers was like. A cute little bat carrying a witch's cauldron. <laughs> and like, it was it was very funny because it was like, these two people did not talk about this before. But you know, there's something for everybody. There is. But anyway, this book is, I would call, Cassie Halloween. Okay. Um, but it's also, it's very fun. It's very clever. It's very cute. Yeah. And it's not, it's not scary. You right. know, this is like it's one. It's just like those little chill spooks uh, that then you giggle after. Yeah, or like, you know, the ghosts are like very friendly looking. Okay. Um, and they do cute things. Like there's a, a page where there's a teacup 
that's just kind of floating in the background. So then the ghost you overlay and it's the ghost is holding the teacup and you're like, that's why it's floating, you know. And Oh, that's cute. It's like super cute. Yeah. And the ghosts are being, they're like very playful. Like they're just screwing around basically. Right. You know? and, um, so yeah, it's like, a. I think it's a really good Halloween read for like the like younger very or, little kids. Yeah. And I think they would really enjoy putting this overlay on and seeing and like trying to guess where the ghosts are going to be or, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm ex- I am I want to try that. That sounds fun for me. So <laughs> it's super cool. If you go to our Instagram at my HPLD, you can see just a brief. I put up a brief video of okay. um, it. So you can see like one or two pages of it. Cool. So that's a there's a ghost in this book. Nice. And I, I don't have much else to say about it because, you know, well, yeah. it's a kid's book. It's yeah. pretty You don't want to give the whole thing away. No, yeah. <laughs> I want to spoil the ending. Does the kid survive? Yes. Yes. Um, I'll go ahead Children's and spoil book. that. Yeah. The kid is at no point in any danger. <laughs> Two very different books regarding yeah. the uh, survivability of the children. Can you tell I'm ready for Halloween season? I was like, <laughs> let's do the spooks books. Yeah. Well, I mean, Evil Bigfoot Monster, the true. making of the movie Leprechaun. True, true. True. Never mind. But I am ready for, for Halloween season. Me too. Yeah. All right. So um, now I'll go through and do the two that I didn't talk about. Okay. Um, so we did talk about The Viking Heart by Arthur Herman. And we talked about Arrangements in Blue by Amy Key. Mm -hmm. Um, The graphic novel we didn't talk about, Eat the Rich by Sarah Gailey, um, is available through Overdrive or Libby, through our Libby app. And it is, uh, there's this couple who are going for the summer to stay with the guy's family. Uh, He comes from wealth and there's this big estate kind of on the beach. And she is, has like they're getting serious so there, he's bringing her home to meet the family, and you get the sense that maybe they're getting ready to take the next step in the relationship. And she arrives there, and there's immediately this like uncomfortable, like way that the the service staff and the family are kind of like friendly, but also very separate, and mm. in a way that she she doesn't come from money, so she's a little creeped out by it. And as she kind of gets settled in the house and starts to, she talks to like the nanny um, Mm -hmm. for the family and it becomes apparent that there's this, uh, this big retirement party planned for the butler. And as you're reading the book, you start to realize that retirement means that you get hunted, slaughtered (laughs) and eaten. It was. I'm laughing because the the distance from retirement to yeah, <laughs> they're gonna hunt you in the woods. <laughs> well, no, it's at the beach, Peter. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Excuse me. I thought this was a horrific thing. Well, and it's not a surprise to them. Like they, all of the service staff go in, um, and they sign a contract that this is how retirement will go. Okay. Um, and so the people that they hire, they all get something out of it. Like, say they have a relative who needs a super expensive treatment mm. for some disease. Okay. Um, the, that will all get covered. You'll get, like, amazing health benefits while you're working there. You'll make a great salary. But when you retire, this is what retirement looks like. Okay. Um. And it's about like she so and what happens is when you eat these meals at the retirement parties, it changes you physiologically and you will never be satisfied by regular food again. You have to eat, you know, human flesh in order to continue to survive. So wait, they hunt the the guy down right and then actually eat him they yeah they have a big barbecue <laughs> okay yeah sure it's like a, a big you know summer barbecue out on the patio you know with all of the rich people yeah why not and the fan like the none of the servants obviously partake <laughs> um but the the family does and so since she's there as family she has now you know eaten ah. some of the retirement dinner so it's about her kind of <laughs> feeling some type of way about, you know, well, they're being taken care of and they're getting important stuff for their life. 
so maybe it's okay, but also like she feels like this is pretty not okay. Yeah. And um uh, and it goes from there. It's about like what does she do about the situation that she's in? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a pickle. It's a pickle. It ends in a in a very interesting and satisfying way, I would say. I have to say that I have a special part in my heart for uh movies with this premise, yeah. especially from like the eighties and nineties. Your your deadly prey. Your, uh, what's the Van Damme one? Hard Target. Sure. And there's the one with Ice-T surviving the game. <laughs> if you ever want to see Ice-T <coughs> hunted by Gary Busey, <laughs> which who doesn't, that's your movie. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there was another one, too, that was more recent. It was like a lady uh, being hunted at like a family, it's kind of a similar like being hunted at a family gathering or something. I can't remember what that one was called. Yeah, I don't know. But the, there's some for some reason that I don't know why that well, premise is just. This book is for you. Yeah, I guess so. I think you should read it. It sounds like. It. Yeah, you can get it, it in Libby. It also gives me vibes of Have you seen that movie, The Menu? No. Highly recommend. Okay. Really good. It's like a horror movie with kind of a premise, but also it's a little silly. Okay. See, I wasn't getting the silly vibe, but I'm more interested now. It's a little silly. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, and then my fourth book is Every Wish Way by Shannon Bright. All right. Uh, so you've got the main character, Isa, who um, has, she's got a very, like I said, difficult to please mother um, who believes that men and romance are not worth the effort. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty sure that she, you know, had some sort of artificial situation to have a child. Like she decided she wanted a child. And so she just took care of it that way rather than go through the whole mess of a relationship. Um, it's been a while since I've read it. So I, I read it early and reviewed it for library journal. So I'm picking these details out of the past. Um, and so Isa has always been trying very hard to please her mom. And so she's been a high achieving her whole life. She's like um, an architect in a big firm, that's doing like fancy work and she, you know, she's doing well for herself. She makes a good salary, but her mom is still like never pleased. And she, she wants a relationship, which, you know, fundamentally she wants her, she not only wants the relationship, she wants her mom to be happy that she has it, which is, feels like a losing battle, honestly. And uh, so she goes on a bad date and she's kind of at home feeling sorry for herself and she's going through a box of stuff and she finds this bottle of glittery nail polish and <laughs> she starts to put it on. And it turns out that it summons this guy named Beckett, who has been kind of cursed to grant wishes for people. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the every person has a different object that summons him. And hers was this bottle of glittery nail polish. And so she makes a couple of wishes you know that wishes never turn out the way that you think that they will. So they're immediately disastrous. And so she's she she's like, OK, so I need to sit and I really need to really think about this. And she remembers how once she and her mom had this conversation and her mom talked about Pride and Prejudice and how she had this thing for Mr. Darcy. Mm -hmm. And she's like, this could be the answer. Mm -hmm. So she wishes to have the modern Mr. Darcy as like to come and court her and like become her partner okay and because then mom would be like i approve exactly okay um but as in everything you know it doesn't quite work out that way and she starts to she starts to have more of a connection with this chaotic beckett you know wish granting mm. character who also like the minute he grants her third wish he disappears for the next person so oh yeah oh uh, okay so, yeah. All right. I like that. It's, you know, not super serious, mm -hmm. um, but it's a good time. It's fun. And she has one friend who's kind of in on it and realizes not only knows that like she didn't just tell her this guy's granting wishes for me, but she was like a witness to one of the wishes. So she like knows that it's real, which makes it more fun because she can kind of like talk things out with this friend. And Gotcha. Yeah. So if you're looking for like a, a little rom-com situation... <laughs> That's not not super serious, but is, you know, light and and entertaining. It's a good place to go. I like in these uh, stories where there's like magic in the world mm -hmm. where sometimes I'm just like you 
magical people are so irresponsible with your like magic. I like I'll just throw this in a box. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, by the way, that summons a genie. I'm like, you don't want to put that in like somewhere. Well, I got the impression that, you know, fate is at work and like it picks an object. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. There's the the universe is kind of right. creating this situation yeah, a little choosing who okay. who he's going to be granting wishes all for. right well i'll be a little easier on all right. this protagonist <laughs> all right <laughs> all right then. i know that my approval is really important to everybody involved yeah. i'm sure that they were losing sleep over it <laughs> i'm so just saying if i had it. a magical object yeah it would be on me at all times you well know? you'd have to know it was magical yeah that's true that's true. I just feel like, you know, in your Harry Potters or something, they're always like, eh, yeah, we just have this old room with like a magic device that yeah. could explode or something. Here's and you're like, this eh, what? invisibility cloak. Um, yeah. We'll just wrap it up and you can keep it in the drawer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just put it with your winter clothes. Right. I'm <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> you know, you don't think somebody would want to use that? I mean, he uses it. He does. <laughs> okay. All so right. I talked Hit about with your four. I did Playground by Aaron Beauregard. That's uh, Kids and Saw. And I did There's a Ghost in This Book, which is Kids and Ghosts in a much cuter way. Right. Uh, okay. Evil Bigfoot Monster I didn't talk about. So Jeff Strand is back. Yes. Well, he's he's never left. He's, he lives permanently in your heart. Always. Yeah. Yep. Um, so basically he wrote this book and he he kind of set out to write the worst book he could. And he published it under the name FF Monsoon because uh, he thought that was funny. And he was kind of hoping that people would just discover it and be like, what is this? I think what happened, ultimately, he revealed that it was by him because nobody bought it. And I think what <laughs> happened, unfortunately, is we live in a world where there is no end to nonsense yeah. like that. You know what I mean? If right. you got on uh, the Kindle store and type in Bigfoot... Yeah. There's a billion things. Not even exaggerating. Yeah. So it's, I think it's hard to stand out yeah. as a bad book in, in any of sort of realm. Books. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, it's a bunch of Bigfoots going on a rampage. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the movie Suburban Sasquatch, which <laughs> is pretty excellent. Um I'm glad I read this after the Max Brooks book, De-Evolution, mm. which is about Bigfoot's attacking. I really liked that book. It was awesome. I loved it. But this would, <laughs> I would have been thinking about this while I read that ah. and being like, ah, this is because I only really have like three reference points for Bigfoot. It would be this, the Patterson footage, and then De-Evolution. What, no Harry and the Hendersons? Uh, Harry and the Hendersons, I vaguely remember. Mm. Um, but yeah. So I guess four. And so if I was reading Max Brooks and those were my options, I'd be like, I mean, one of them is neutral. Two of them are goofy as I'll get out. And then now I'm trying to take it seriously, but having a hard time. So he does things like a character's name changes from Drexel to Drexer just right. suddenly and then it just stays <laughs> that way. There's also um, I had to flip back and forth a little because so at one point the Drexel. Drexer, I think he is at this point, gets his ankle crushed by the Bigfoot. And then like three pages later, uh, he's like running around and then it's like, and then a Bigfoot crushed his ankle or something. <laughs> so it's like written as though the person who wrote it forgot that they had already, the right. character had sustained this exact injury already. So then he has the exact same thing happen again. Um, it is really funny, especially I think... If you're the kind of person who has maybe read some really bad stuff and you can kind of recognize that I should, this may be an audience of one, <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm, I'm here for it. It, it found its audience, if yep. that's the case. Um, but I don't know if you kind of like that sort of thing. Like if you like watching a movie that's kind of badly constructed and just sort of seeing like, oh, I, I see what they did here. And that's kind of like the genius, but inaccessibility of it is because you're like, he does these things that you're like, I completely understand what happened here because I have tried to do this myself. Right. And I, I've made that mistake, <laughs> you know, and then, <laughs> um, but I, I recommend it. Okay. 
The other one is The Making of the Movie Leprechaun, I Need Me Gold by B. Harrison Smith. Okay, so I went in expecting almost nothing from this book, right? Because I was like, the, honestly, when I first saw it, I was like, I'm curious. And it's like 250 pages. And I was like, oh, I don't know. You know, I was kind of hoping it would be an 80 pager. Yeah. Because um, I've read a few of these that can go unnamed. But, you know, they've been like the, the micro history of like uh, Freddy versus Jason is one I started in on. And it's just like, it's not that exciting and it's not that good. Like it's about how the studios pass the property back and forth and stuff. And you're like, yeah, who cares? Right. Um. I was extremely pleasantly surprised when really? I started reading this. Yes, because it kind of it has like an intro, but then it opens. The author's first section is about how he worked in a movie theater in I think it was ninety two, ninety three when Leprechaun came out, and he was working in a movie theater at the time that was in a mall, and they had like the main theater with like six screens, and then they had a like an annex of two screens that was on the other side of the mall. And they were teeny tiny and they called that the hinterlands. And he was like, so, you know, we'd work at the movie theater. And back then you had to like assemble the reels when they came and put the films together. So you had to put them together and then watch them so that you knew it was correctly put together. So they would have movie nights where the staff would go and most would be, you know, using substances and they would make like a garbage bag, (laughs) a little garbage bag of popcorn and they would watch these movies. And so they also had to put the trailers on and he was like, the trailer for Leprechaun came on and everybody was dying laughing. And like, he was like, it became a catchphrase at the theater among the staff. I need me gold, (laughs) you know, like it just, (laughs) and they would kept shouting it, you know, and it just kind of became code for like whatever. Um, So the movie's coming out and it's coming out in January, which is when studios famously dump their garbage. Because they're like, ugh, I don't know what to do with it. Just put it out in January. No one's going to the theater anyway. Nobody's going. Um, So they're putting it out in January, and this guy is talking to the theater owner. And he's like, so Leprechaun, that's going to Hinterlands, right? And the guy's like, nope, that's going on the big screen. And he's like, you've (laughs) got to be kidding me. And he's like, I'm not kidding. And the guy's like, I know the, the trailer was fun, but I think this is a big mistake. And the owner's like, it's going. And, you know, he was like, to be fair, it was the only new movie that was coming out that week. Everything else was a holdover from, you know, whatever. So they put it up and he's like, it didn't explode, but it did pretty good. Um, And he's like, and it stayed in the big theater for like three or four weeks, which shocked me. And he's like, and what was funny is people coming out of it were like pumped. And laughing and, you know, people coming out were screaming, I need me gold, you know, and like, um, so anyway, I read this first section and I was like, this is great. Like the writing is really good. And the author is like enthusiastic about it, but also real about it. Like he's not pretending like this is great cinema. Right. You know what I mean? A lost treasure. Yeah. He's not trying to convince you that Leprechaun is like, yeah, a a buried treasure of, you know, AFI top 100 film or something. But he he does, and he talks about, you know, a lot of things that I think people would be nostalgic for, like the way theaters used to work and the way rental used to work and the way a lot of this used to work and movies kind of worked and all that stuff. Um, so I, I was pleasantly surprised because I was expecting a slog that I would try to go through for the sake of the information, because I guess (laughs) this is the sort of hell that I've trapped myself in is I want to be a person who knows things about the movie Leprechaun. Um, but also, so I, I recommend it and I, I brought it too, because in our October newsletter, we're going to have a complete rundown of the Leprechaun series in HPLD's cult movie vault. All right. So I hope everybody's ready for that, including Leprechaun going to space, Leprechaun going to the hood, and Leprechaun going back to the hood. Question. Uh-huh. you watched all of these. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's dedication. Yeah. Uh, I think the third one was actually my least favorite, though, where he goes to Vegas. Which you would think would be fine. It was terrible. Okay. It's, it was 
That was the point where Cassie jumped off the wagon. She watched that one, and then I started. You know, <laughs> she is long suffering, and I salute her for even trying. <laughs> About thirty seconds into the fourth one, which is Leprechaun in Space, where <laughs> Leprechaun's living on an asteroid for no reason. <laughs> And is trying to marry a space princess and has a lightsaber and then space marines show up and it's just like, she was like, I'm out. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> you know, I salute her. I think Leprechaun in Space, I, I was sad that that one was after Vegas because Vegas seemed just lazy and bad. Uh, Leprechaun in Space was ambitious and bad, <laughs> so... I was like, you know, that gives you, it was the movie that I was like, I don't know if there's ever been a movie where the budget and the script was a worse mismatch mm-hmm. because of the things they tried to do were <laughs> somebody, an accountant needed to look at that and be like, no, yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> we're not doing this. So anyway, all right. Um, <laughs> a really, really great book about a uh, not really great movie, but uh, I feel like the author's skill and voice really pulled it off, yeah. and I'm hopeful that he'll write other things because well, it just it worked. It was great. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'm excited that it, it turned out to be you know its own hidden gem. It was a it was a pleasant surprise. Yeah. It was a treat as opposed to a trick. Nicely done. I've been Peter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that, that's our eight titles. There you go. You'll well, have to, maybe people will let us know if, if we sound buttery. If we sound evil. Yes. Let us know. <laughs> I feel like that's much more fun for me than anybody listening. <laughs> but, you know. You know, it's isn't it all about like what we are, what, what we want to do anyway? I think so. Yeah. Until we hear otherwise and no one has ever contacted us. Yeah. It's one hour a month, people. Come on. Like this is our one joy in life. <laughs> I, I just told you about how I was dead inside and, you know, playground couldn't quite reach me. This is the one thing I enjoy. Don't try and take it away. <laughs> That's a lie. You also enjoy terrible movies. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say I actually enjoyed watching Leprechaun in the Hood, but, you know, I enjoyed that I wouldn't have to watch it ever again because I've right. now seen well, it. Well, and you enjoy being able to torture others with explanations about it. Yeah. And there is one still in the movie of uh, the Leprechaun, played by Warwick Davis, sharing a marijuana cigarette with iced tea. So... Well, you know, that's something that's an iconic moment in in cinema. If I had to look at I try and look at bad movies of like if I had to have one positive takeaway, one good thing to say about it. I'm like that that happened is a positive. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) That that is a thing that happened. (laughs) All right. All right, then. Well, I think we did the thing. We did it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. And uh, have a spooky Halloween month. Watch something at your level of scary and think of us. Yeah, watch like five things at your level of scary and then maybe one that's a little too far. Yeah. That's what I recommend. One where when the sun goes down, you kind of regret it. Yeah. One where Cassie's a little mad at you. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you next time. Bye.